Hello, everyone. This is Todd Middle Initial C. Walker, the host of the Wispy Mop Music Acoustic Radio Podcast Series. Recently, I had the chance to have a discussion with Douglas Wynott. Now, Douglas Wynott is a writer of nonfiction novels. Reportage, I think, is the word for it he used. But the reason for the video originally was because he has written a book about Sammy Price, the king of boogie woogie. Now, Doug is a blues boogie woogie piano player himself. And during that interview, he talked about his journey on how he became a writer and then what it's like to be a writer. Is it exciting? Is it drudgery sometimes? It might be fun for those of you who are thinking of getting into writing to listen to one man's journey. So sit right there and listen to Douglas Why Not talk about his journey. When did you discover that you had the ability to write or that you had the, the dream of writing? I was uh, fairly young. I was, of course, I had great reading experiences, you know, that were important. But one thing that sort of directed me was that uh, my uncle, the uncle I described, who was a who was a, a jazz musician himself at one time, up until the Depression, and then he started a jewelry store in Boston. Um, he collected National Geographic's. And at one point, when he was moving from to another house, he gave me his collection, and it was a, it was decades uh, that went way way back, uh, you know, like from the 20s to the 50s or that sort of thing. So, um, and I looked at them, and inside the uh, masthead, it said, "Generous remuneration made for articles accepted." <laughs> so I thought, wow, people actually go out into the world, all over the world, and hang out with interesting people and they get paid for this. I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there was that part of me, the practical part living on Cape Cod and being close to the ocean that said, I want to major in marine biology. Um, and uh, I had these dual aspirations of uh, becoming a marine biologist and coming back here and then, uh, or becoming a writer. And that's what really caused me to step back and say, I need to figure this out. So I got a job at Sealand putting on dolphin shows and talking to school kids about marine life. Um, but that was uh, enough for me, plus the fact that uh, science courses were really hard for me and math courses were even harder. Uh, so I didn't think that was going to, going to, to be feasible. Um, but I thought, well, um, I'll study anthropology a little bit. I took some anthropology courses because that's what National Geographic was about. But that still wasn't the way to become a writer. It, was, it would be a help, help, helpful way. Um, but eventually I said, well, I'm going to go to UMass and study journalism. So I did. I studied journalism and English. They were, they were joint majors. Uh, and that's how I uh, made the next step. And of course, the final step was when I said to my one of my journalism professors who taught article writing, which I saw, you know, that was the course I needed to take. That was very, very uh, transitional for me. Um, I said, how do I become successful at this? He said, go through an MFA program and study fiction. That way you'll learn about narrative, character development, point of view, um, more about style. And so I said, okay, here I go. So as a person who didn't write fiction, I went into, I took a couple of fiction workshops as an undergrad, though I can't say I didn't write it, but that wasn't my goal. Um, I went into a fiction program and, and wrote short stories, but also started my first book. Um, because um, one summer in graduate school, I worked for the state of Massachusetts Department of Agriculture as an apiary inspector. I was keeping bees at the time. Um, and so I met someone who had a 4,000 beehives that he transported ported to Florida for the winter, and that became my topic for my first book. So I was writing short stories and the first couple chapters of my book, and that became my master's thesis, MFA thesis. And from there, I went on to finish the book, and it was published. Now, did you continue to write short stories, or was that it? Once that was you, it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wrote one that was published in the uh, alumni magazine for the University of Massachusetts. Um, but I kept on getting ideas and assignments for nonfiction books. And once I wrote the first one, then it was, okay, what am I going to do next? And that's when I got into Giant Bluefin. Don't, you know, this, this one, 
One of the editors, the editor who published the paperback version of my first book about beekeepers called Following the Bloom, wanted to work with me on a topic. So we searched and searched around. Um, and um, we, uh, well, we, we couldn't find a topic that worked. Um, but I came upon a newspaper story that said that uh, the bluefin tuna fishery was perhaps threatened by overfishing. Um, and I investigated it. I had a friend who I went to high school with, Nelson Shiflett, who introduced me to a bluefin tuna fisherman in Barnstable, and I wrote a book proposal. And the editor I worked with was along with me, and she, the, the, the book proposal went into an auction when several publishers bid, and she was way outbid. Um, and I got a contract with the best literary publisher in New York for that book. Wow. Uh, Ferris Strauss and Giroux, who told me it was the best uh, piece of reportage that had come to that publisher for many years. Many a moon or many a, something like that. Um, yeah, and so I ended up having this great publisher um, uh, for that book about the bluefin tuna fishery. And it got this wonderful, wonderful review in the New York Times. Uh, I just got really lucky with, with, some, with a reviewer who understood that I was writing about the fish, but I was also writing about the conservation, but I was also writing about the fishermen mm -hmm. who were people who I knew growing up and who my grandfather praised fishermen. It was, it was a noble profession. It wasn't, you know, a, um, a villainous use of resources. It was, a, it, was, it was something that was very hard to be, and people who made it were regarded as, as, as really accomplished people. So the book is dedicated to my grandfather and to my daughters. Uh, and so that's how I got to, to that point. Well, you have a very unique style of writing or way of writing. I don't know how the proper way to say that is that I feel like I'm along for the ride, but I'm invisible. And, but I'm actually part of what's going on. I really like what he has to say about that. <laughs> and it's, and I've read Sugar Season. I'm into the bluefin, and I've read the the first section of you know Sammy Price biography. I guess you'd call it a biography. Although there's a lot of you in it too. So I would. Yeah, I call it a uh, narrative nonfiction. Okay. A hybrid form in the sense that it's both memoir and biography mm -hmm. and history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's you, just the way you write, and each one of the three, and I am going to purchase the, the you know, one on beekeeping, is each one is different, but there's a constant through all of them that it's almost like if you're listening to music and the drummer hits the hi-hat or something and you get a spike, you've got the constant the constant, but then you've got these little ups and downs and, and stuff. And it becomes this whole picture in my head that it's like going to the movies without going to the movies, if that makes any sense. Wow. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm I'll thrilled to that you're... I'll you further on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled thank that you. It's just you... great to hear. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. But, you know, growing it's, it's up... It's hard to be a writer. Uh, you're alone. Mm -hmm. Publishing is changing. It's, it's, it's being consolidated, and your book comes out, and, you know, you have things, things happen, but books have, uh, you know, shelf lives. And um, it's great to know, it's wonderful to hear from people who have read it, and it's even more wonderful for a writer who works in solitude a lot of the time. I mean, it's, being a writer is sitting in a chair by yourself day after day in a, in a room, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so when you hear someone who's read your work and thought about it and perceived and even more so compared one book to another, you, you just feel very grateful. Um, and so, you know, that's... Well, that's for those people who are watching this who might want to read one of your books, how would they find one? Well... Um, Following the Bloom is still in print uh, with uh, Penguin, Tarcher. Giant Bluefin with, with Ferris Strauss and Giroux will always be in print, my mm -hmm. editor told me. Um, my third book, which was about a boatyard in Maine, run by the son of E.B. White, oh. um, was um, a best 
bestseller in some places, the Washington Post. Really? Yeah. Um, that's still available. Um, it was originally published with Doubleday, um, and then the paperback was published with Washington Square Press. That's still available. Um, so in, in the sugar season um, is uh, possibly going to be reissued. Um, the sugar season is out of print, and that's because the company was consolidated and, and, and then dissolved. Uh, so now we're working with a new publisher to reissue it. So um, that would be harder to find, but I'll send you the book if you want. Uh, and so we, the Hachette Publishing Company now has it, and we're negotiating about uh, a paperback reissue. Well, I have the copy of The Sugar Season. Oh, you do? Okay. have the Bluefin, and I have, I'm looking forward to the entire book about Sammy Price. Because so it. far, it's been fascinating, yeah. not only about him, but learning things about you that I was totally unaware of growing up. Mm. I mean, you have just this... You said something about me um, after you watched, I think, The Verdict, something you said I was genetically gifted. You were. You were genetically and, gifted. And I wrote back to you and said, au contraire, basically, the, the genetically know. gifted should be directed at you, not me. And I felt so humbled I couldn't even respond to you. But Todd was the state champion in the 100-yard dash and uh, the fastest runner I'd ever seen. And so... Um, but you forget to tell everybody you were number one in the javelin throw. Well, but being first in the 100-yard dash, I mean, that's the premier event. Well, I'm, it's, it's only because it's exciting. <laughs> I yeah, always wondered... You were gifted genetically, I mean... How did you... This is the thing that has always... Not bothered me, but I've always wondered about... Because there's spotters in the javelin. Because they have to go out and, and determine how far you threw it. Yeah. And does anybody ever get hurt? I think so. Because that's a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a spear. Yeah, it is a spear. And I have heard about people being really? hit by it, but I was fortunately never hit anyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. It so, is dangerous. It can be dangerous. Yeah. 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 So, so and I'm anyway. curious too, how did you go about choosing the javelin? Was that something that the coach came up with, said, here, try this? Oh, No. I, I wasn't playing a spring sport in my sophomore year. I was sort of just goofy and hanging out, you know. But I did, was able to throw a ball pretty hard. My cousin, Freddie Thatcher, yeah. was a pitcher. We used to hang out together. We used to go into David Romer's sand pit and throw rocks and stuff. And I had a good throwing arm, like he did. And in gym class, they played that awful game called Bombardment. Yes. And I picked up the ball and threw it a few times. And the football coach came to me and said, you have a fantastic arm. You should go out for a spring sport. So he told both the baseball coach and the track coach. And I ended up choosing the javelin because I used to watch them throwing the javelin. And I'd say, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I'd like to do that. Yeah. That's how I made it out there. And I happened to be one year behind a guy who was state champion before me mm -hmm. and threw it farther than I did but also had a great javelin and a great set of javelin spikes that I used in, in, in the state eat my senior year. So, but we get off track, we digress. <laughs> <laughs> now, to write a novel, at least in your experience, because I'm sure every novelist or writer who writes a book, um, it's a little bit different. From the time you come up with the subject matter and mm -hmm. say, okay, this is what I want to write about, until it's actually completed to your satisfaction, not necessarily edited, but to your satisfaction before you send it off to you. How long of a time span can that be? Usually for me, it was three years. That long? Yeah. I, for Giant Bluefin, I went out on tuna boats and on their planes and did research at Woods Hole that lasted two years, uh, from 92 to 94. I wrote the draft in 94. That took most of a year. Wow. It took 1,400 hours. I actually kept track. And then it was edited. And that's a long process, too. So usually for me, it's two years of research and a year of writing. But it can vary. Um, Do you ever wake up one morning and go, oh, I should write, but I don't feel like it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do. But then I usually go up there anyway. 
one of the things I had to do was establish discipline. And, and I had, my first teacher said, um, well, not my first teacher, but the teacher who was most important to me said, set a certain time every day to write. He said, I write from nine to noon um, and, and, and be religious about it. Go there every day and spend that time writing. And even if you hate it, you don't want to do it. Even if you have to go sit in your desk and stare at the wall, just be there. And eventually it'll become part of your life and a habit. So I did that. You know, just like I learned to tune the piano and play the piano, I started writing from nine to noon. And then, you know, that varied. Maybe it became 10 to, 10 to 1 or 2. For, you mentioned the sugar season. Um, I wrote that book in Bogota, Colombia, while I was on a Fulbright fellowship. I applied for a Fulbright so I could be far away in seclusion. And I taught a single course down there in creative writing. Um, and I spent six days a week um, writing that book. And I would, I would start at eight or nine in the morning, go to three or four in the afternoon. I'd take a break for lunch and then I'd go sometimes till 5.30. Uh, and I wrote three drafts when I was down there. So you must have an incredible encyclopedic memory or either that or take incredible notes that you can look at because just remembering the names of the people, um, the different firms that uh, kind of stole the maple syrup and things like that, because as you say, there was skullduggery in that. Yeah. Um, and just going and walking the lines, which I never knew that's how they did it. I'm, I'm from old school where they hang a bucket. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that they went into lines. I mean, it's a fascinating book. So how did you keep all that information fresh in your mind to be able to sit down in Bogota, Colombia and write it? Well, I take notes that are really detailed and extensive, and I take them um, from the time I begin a project till the end. When I went to Bogota, Colombia, I had about 800 pages of single space notes. Wow. The book I'm writing now, I had... Um, notes from that time, transcribed. I had lessons that I recorded uh, and transcribed. Um, and um, I had files that I assembled. I wrote several drafts, and I just didn't feel that I had enough material. And then I discovered that um, his Sammy Price's archives had become available after being 20 years in storage. Well, I started again. I spent two years going down to Harlem to the Schomburg Center for uh, Research in Black Culture, a part of the New York Public Library. Two years going down there, making appointments and staying for several days at a time. And that go all went into transcriptions. Mm. Um, I photographed a thousand documents of, of his personal life, letters, contracts, um, financial records. And then I, I've spent um, four years writing that book, and I've just finished. So this one involved more work than ever, um, but um, I think it's worth it. Oh, my, it what I've read story. so far, it's fantastic. Thank you. I mean, it's just, I mean, I really enjoyed Sugar Season, and Sugar Season to me is like when you want to relax, you put on your, your tried and true slippers. That's the way that book <laughs> reads, yeah. kind of reads in my head. Okay. Um, you know, the giant bluefin, that's more like exciting, hurry up and wait, exciting, hurry mm -hmm. up and wait. And I'm, I'm a you know pilot, so I love the fish spotting and talking about that. And Sammy Price, it's, it's like a... It is the dual subject matter. It's you and Sammy and your interaction with him. And then around that is all the history of blues piano with all these other people mentioning and piano tuning. So I am so looking forward to the, the finished, you know, published book. But I have a question. What's the next book going to be about? Oh, gee, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And I really haven't been looking um, and I'm kind of looking forward to that time when I'm open to anything. Right. Um, and I think that's the way it's been with almost all of them. I haven't, I have a friend who, you know, who planned five novels ahead, but I don't do that. Um, although 
you know, I have at times said, when I finish this book about giant bluefin or when I finish this book about this boat yard, I'm going to work on the Sammy Price book again. And I did that a few times. But I needed more material. Um, and maybe I needed time to reflect. I thought back then at times, I thought, this might be a book for later in life. Um, and when I discovered the archives that were available, um, that there were 10 boxes packed with hundreds and hundreds of documents, I decided to retire from teaching so that I could write full time. Wow. I had always wanted to do that, but you know, life's demands. And teaching often goes in tandem with writing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but, uh, so this time I was, I was able to write full time. And I deliberately did not seek a contract. I had contracts and advances for my other books because I didn't want a deadline. Right. Um, I came up a dead, against deadlines a few times and I felt I just wasn't ready to finish. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I would do an afterword on a book um, when it was in the process of editing. You know, I did that with the, with the, the book about the boatyard because the man I was writing about was dying from cancer at the time. And when I left, he, he hadn't died. Uh, but when I went back for the launching of the boat I was writing about, he had died. So there was a lot I had to revisit. This time, I made sure to, to, to be somewhere where I could write in Bogota, and I didn't have a contract. Um, oh, I'm sorry, no. That was the sugar season. Yeah. Sorry, we get them mixed up. That was what I did that time. This time, I retired and spent just as much time as I could and got just as much material as I could and went back and did interviews with people from his family and uh, got the material I wanted um, to, to put this book where I wanted it to be because I felt that this book was kind of the book of my, covering my, almost my whole career. In 1982, when I went to see him for the first time, I was a graduate student. And when I finished, I was teaching at UMass. It was a, I was a, a lecturer. Um, so it's really covered my whole career, working with this man, knowing this man, studying with him, thinking about his music, and then learning more about his life. And so it's, it's, it's um, you know, traveled with me throughout my, my whole career as a writer. And now, will it be the finish of my career? I don't know. <laughs> Writing books is e exhausting. Um, and when I finish, usually finish a book, I am exhausted. When I was in Bogota, and when I was writing the acknowledgments for that book after three drafts, um, I collapsed in the street. Really? I, was, uh, I went out on a Friday afternoon to a bakery, and on the way home, I started to get lightheaded. Uh, and then I started to panic because I got really lightheaded. And I crashed into a wall and went headfirst into an intersection, a busy intersection. And then I, I woke up, and there was an ambulance there. And there was someone next to me and said, we're going to put you in the ambulance. And she did. They did. They put me in the ambulance. And I, I was looking out at the intersection. And then I happened to glance out the side door. And there were six of my students from my oh, gosh. class at the university um, who had been out watching a soccer game. Um, Columbia was playing Argentina. And she had gone through my recent calls and called these students and told them where I was. And they, came, they took taxis, there were taxis all over Bogota, these little yellow taxis. And they came and walked with me to the hospital. Uh, and I was okay. There were no, they didn't find anything. I, I might have had a concussion. But uh, that's all to say <laughs> that writing books makes, makes you tired sometimes uh, and maybe a little lightheaded. But, uh, but it's fun. It's still worth it. Yeah. When it comes out right and when you feel you've done it right, there is really... I mean, I won't say there's no feeling like it because there are other different kind of feelings that are wonderful, but it is a great, great feeling even to write an essay or uh, that's right, or a chapter or whatever um, to finish a book. And, you know, it's just a, it's just a fantastic feeling. So, so how did, again, how do people find, whoops, <laughs> knocking your microphone out of the way. Yeah. How do people find you? What's your website? Uh, my website is douglaswynot.com. And how do you spell why not? W-H-Y-N-O-T-T. -T. And my books are on Amazon. Um, they, can, they can be found there. Or, you know, other places. Well, this has been fantastic. Can you play like 30, 45 seconds of some 
Boogie Woogie Blues for sure, us? Sure, sure. I'll play and, this thing. I and while, we, while he's playing that, we're going to say goodbye to you folks. Thanks for watching. Check Thanks out so my friend Douglas Wynott. I know him as Doug. Our track coach used to call him Dougie Wynott. But uh, he's a fantastic, really multi-leveled person. I, who knew? It's been so much fun getting to know him better. And uh, away we go with some blues piano. That's a wrap. <laughs> Good. That was great. Thank you. We got more into my books than we did in the music, but we covered it all. That's we did. It was yeah, good. Okay. <laughs>